All right. You know I like podcasts. Well, you know, Holland, I really don't think you're the only one who likes podcasts because we actually started the afterward because we both enjoyed this learning platform. It was a wonderful way to be entertained and get to know other people and be creative. What's one of your top picks from your podcast library? I actually was listening to an episode of this right before we started recording. Um, It's a new show called On the Whistle, and it's all about youth sports and how youth sports can help change a person, a family, a neighborhood, even a whole country. And the stories that they're telling on the On the Whistle podcast are just amazing. Well, that's a pretty big um, order there for changing the whole country. But, you know, it is telling. People do like sports. They like watching them cheering. And that episode we did our very first season um, on stories behind athletes with Dr. Tom LeGrand and Brendan Scott. It is still one of our best performing shows. Right. So I thought for 2021, we should dig a little bit deeper into that topic because people liked it so much and talk about the stories of lives changed by sports. Before we talked about stories that make it on TV, stories that make it into a book, but not the stories we hear every day. So I like this idea. You know, I like hearing the the untold stories and bringing them to light. So we found two great guests to help us understand this topic as we kick off our third season of 2021 on The Afterword. Hi, I'm Holland Webb. Hi, I'm Amy Bolin. And you're listening to The Afterword, a conversation about the future of words. We have Rashid Wright, who played pro basketball in France for 13 years before becoming director of Pro Skills Basketball in Richmond. And of course, most importantly, marrying my cousin, Rashid. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now. Hey, Amy. Um, hey, Holland. Thanks for having me on there. Um, well, one of the things I'm doing is being a husband and a father. <laughs> That's the most important thing that I do. I um been married for 14 years. I have four beautiful daughters. Um, I'm a high school girls basketball coach in Midlothian, Virginia, as well as the director of Pro Skills Basketball Richmond, which is a national youth basketball organization in the country. I am also the director of basketball at a a sports and performance academy here in Richmond, Virginia called U-Turn. Vice president of a nonprofit organization that's geared towards helping young people be the best version of themselves. And I'm a basketball skills coach. So that all that really means is I don't sleep. I was going to say, <laughs> Rashi, there's no way that you uh, get much time off. Good for you. That's awesome. Thank you. And joining Rashid, we have Jeff Hood. Jeff is the chief executive officer at National Association of Police Athletic Activities Leagues. Jeff, what keeps you up at night? Listening to Rashid. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> But no, what, what, what keeps me up, um, you know, as the CEO for, for a national organization, you know, it's looking at and trying to identify effective programming and community-based programs that can engage our young people all across this country as well as internationally. And, um, you know, with, with over 350 PAL chapters, you know, across the country serving, you know, over 1.5 million young people, as well as having PAL programs in Nigeria, Africa, and partnerships in, in Sydney, Australia, and, and New Zealand, and, and all, um, trying to identify what works best um, amongst our young people and, and how best we can communicate. You know, we're all sensitive to what's, what's been going on in, in regards to the issue with George Floyd and, 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 and that type of thing. We are the world's foremost leader of engaging kids, cops, and communities. And, and of course, as you can imagine, with that situation having taken place, my phone has been ringing off the hook of how can we get more PAL programs in, in communities to be able to aid and assist in opening up effective and, and intentional dialogue and discussion amongst community as well as with law enforcement. So. We're continuing to to be that change agent in a lot of communities. And um, and then in addition to all of that, I have my own foundation, Hoodie's House of Hope for Youth, named after my mother. We call my mother Hoodie. Uh, she's a former educator, still with us, over 90 years old. And it's one of those things that was birthed upon 
giving person their flowers while they're still alive instead of them passing away. And then you want to name all these things after them and do all of these things. So I started this foundation to aid uh, young people as well as engage homelessness and underserved communities and populations as well. And then with that, we have a school in Thomas E. Lee, Haiti, the only school in there in that region. And I we provide education for over 120 kids annually uh, that if it wasn't for our foundation and our school, they would not be getting any formalized education as well. So all of that is is kind of what keeps me up at night, but it's all about our young people first and foremost. Holy cow, I don't think you sleep either, Jeff. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we get into what you have to say on all these subjects, and clearly you have the professional background to address everything we're talking about. I know you both have really interesting personal stories. Would you be willing to give us like a 60 second Cliff's Notes version of your life story, Jeff? You know, I, I, I'm, I'm this. Um, I'm, I'm a very spiritual and religious person first. And, um, and for me, what, what, what leads and guides me is any and every day on this side of the dirt is a wonderful day. You know, so as long as I'm on this side of the dirt and um, not trying to be insulting upon anyone in their faith, but what works and speaks to me is my relationship with, with, with God and, um, and trying to be obedient to him. So that's what leads and guides me and directs me every day. Wow. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Rashid, you have a Cliff's Notes version of, of your biography? Yeah. Um, I was born in uh, Richmond, Virginia. Um, moved to Greensboro, North Carolina when I was five years old. Basketball is my first love. Um, I don't really remember a time not playing basketball. Um, I got cut from my middle school my seventh grade year. I, I think that kind of sparked a growth in me. Of course, my parents as well, but that kind of sparked a growth in me that um, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to accept all challenges, all challenges, and I'm determined to be successful regardless of any adversities that come my way. So with that work ethic, I end up being a pretty good basketball player in the state of North Carolina. I was top 200 in the nation in 1999, number one shooting guard in the state of North Carolina. I broke all my high school scoring records. And um, then I earned a scholarship to go play college basketball at Old Dominion University, where I followed Jeff Capel um, there, who was a coach at North Carolina a and when I was growing up. So I'm really, really close with that family. Had a good four years. I met my now wife at Old Dominion University. I scored a thousand points there. I was like every other kid trying to make it to the NBA. Didn't quite make it there. Got a professional contract to play in France. And I played in France for 13 years. Um, as a matter of fact, I've only been back in the country for four years. So um, French is my second language. I'm fluent in French. Um, and me, me living in France really opened my eyes to so many things um, that I could not even conceive before I left this country. I learned a lot about myself being somewhere where all of your norms are taken away from you. Uh, mm -hmm. It made me question a lot of things that I had been taught were true. It, it, it turned me into a big learner of history and digging into history and digging into the whys of, 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 of the things that we do. Um, I'm a lot like Jeff. Um, I wouldn't say I'm very religious, but I'm very spiritual. God, universe, Allah, whatever the name people choose, that power that, 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 is evidently there is the thing that I lean on. Um, and it's the thing that's been guiding me all my life. And um, now being back, we moved back to Nilothian, Virginia, because my wife is from here. And I kind of had to start over. So I just started out just doing what I love to do. And that's being in the gym, sweating with kids, teaching them the game of basketball. And it's really my, it's really my language. It's my way to teach confidence. It's my way to teach sacrifice, hard work, teamwork, communication. I, was, I earned a degree in communication. So I'm, I'm a communications advocate as well and that's just the, one of the fundamental parts of basketball so now with all the things i told you i do before i call it following the breadcrumbs i really i really i'm not gonna say that i don't have a plan because i do but i work really hard through my passions and what i love to do and i feel i feel like god just light lights up the floor and i just go in that direction and, and, and it really that's why i'm sitting here right now so mm -hmm. that's why i stand today oh my goodness Tom, this is gonna be a lot of fun 
All right. <laughs> I hope our listeners have strapped in for this episode because this is going to be amazing. Jeff, I'm going to start with you first. What do you think modern kids need from mentors, coaches, and other interested adults? What do these modern kids need? <laughs> a, a few things. First, one of the things they need is someone that is intentional and willing to listen, you know, and relate to exactly what it is that they are going through and where they are at at that time and not about the institutionalization of mentoring, what I call it, right? Everybody knows what mentoring looks like in, in, in all. These kids these days, that's not them. You know, you have to be willing to to um, go into conversation with young people with an open mind and not, as, as our young people say, without judging. You know, they don't need to be judged. They don't want to be judged. Um, and, and commitment. You know, that's the thing. And the thing that I and that's always been the case. Right. Is as I go around the country and I speak and, and, and I tell people, says, look, if you're going to be a mentor, first and foremost, you have to make sure that you're committed, you know, because young people these days have had enough abandonment issues in their lives already. They don't need somebody else coming into their life and adding to their abandonment, you know, to whereas they feel like they're vibing with you and they can trust you. And then you say, oh, look, so and so I'm going to come or I'm going to call you or I'm going to come see you this weekend. And then they're looking at the door every week on the weekend. It's like, okay, where, where is he or she? And then he doesn't show. She doesn't show. That sends all the wrong messages that here's yet another person that doesn't really care about me. And that's why, you know, we talk about gangs. That's part of the reasons why gangs are so, <laughs> you know, so prevalent is because <laughs> those gang members are like, yeah, that's, that's my brother. You're part of our family. All of those units is what they're using, these gangs are using to attract young people because that's what they're missing either at home or in the community. So I would say just making sure that you are an intentional listener, that's hard for a lot of people. There are people don't want to talk. And it's like, I know what's best for you. This works for me in 1957. You know what? <laughs> Uh, no, that, that may not be where they are headed, you know, in, in 2020, 2021. So be intentional, be an active listener, and um, hear them out. That's awesome. I, I'm watching Rashid's head bounce. Yeah, he's just totally <laughs> with you. Rashid, you got something else to add? And, and, and maybe then take this question a little bit further, Rashid. How do you create a positive environment with sports? Well, I, one, my head is bouncing because I, I agree completely with Jeff. I, I, I mean, that, that that is, and I kind of have a little different view because I, I, I didn't live here for 13 years. So in a lot of ways, when, when I've come back, I feel like I'm in a time warp. You know what I mean? Like some things, like, well, we can't do this. We can't say that. Okay, it's all these parameters of things that you can and can't do, but nobody's really listening to what the children are saying. Nobody's really tap, tapped in to... Um, what's important to them. Um, but just to piggyback off of what Jeff said, don't lie to children. I say this to adults all the time. Do not lie to children. We live in the technology age. The same question they ask you, they can ask their phone. Mm -hmm. And once they see you as a liar, you've lost all credibility. And when we were coming up, I'll be 40 in a few days, right? So when I was coming up, you, you would do what you told your parents say this. You ain't really had no way to fact check that. Yeah. You know, if, if your parents said this is how it is, even if you had some questions, you really couldn't. Now they can walk right around the corner and, they, and they have the science behind why mm -hmm. <laughs> they have the answer to this question. So I think listening and also continuing to learn yourself as adults, we can't get mm -hmm. to a position of we know it all. Every single day should be a learning and growing opportunity for us as well. And that's how I go about coaching. I coach from that aspect. If I'm wrong, I'm going to say I'm wrong. And I'm going to actively continue to learn new and ways of playing the game of basketball because it's different than how it was when I was coming up in their same, in their same age. And I, and I think that that right there opens the door for kids to be open and honest with you because that's what you want. You want them to trust you. 
Because when if they don't trust you, you can't help them. So I think that creates a positive environment and also being vulnerable. I think I think a lot of times that the people in the power position are reluctant to be vulnerable. That's why I said I got cut in seventh grade. Because when I walk into a room and somebody says, here's a 13-year pro, here's all these great things I did with basketball, a lot of these kids immediately, they look up there like, oh, and I, and I need them to know quickly, hold up. I remember times when I won't confident. I remember crying when I got cut from the middle school team. I remember feeling like I wasn't one of the better players. Like, I went through all these things that y'all are going through right now, so I understand. But on the flip side of that, if you don't want to feel that, or if you really want to be good at basketball, which is, I call basketball life school because it applies to everything else. If you want to be good at something, or, or Stephen Curry is your favorite player, I don't want you to shoot the basketball and run down the court without looking at see the win the basket. I want to show you this video of how hard he worked on something. I'm not going to say you can't be Stephen Curry, but let's go through the process of work that he does every single day, and then let's see how we measure up over time. So I don't shoot kids' dreams down by telling them what they can and can't do. I'm just very realistic with the process of achieving what they say they want to do. Amy, I'm not I'm, just to, to to piggyback on on Rashid because that's correct. Is people want the lifestyle without the work sometimes? Mm, you right? got it. And I'm so glad you mentioned Stefan. He's family. People don't understand how much work he puts in. You know, they just think that he goes out and he's shooting from half court. And they don't see the how many reps that he had to go through to get that 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 muscle memory, you know, to be able to to hit those shots, right? And to that end, I started several months ago through National Pal. We started this initiative called National Pal Hosts from the Voices of Youth, right? And and it's an eighteen city virtual tour. And in each of the cities that, that we go into, we bring in the change agents in those communities. Um, normally it's the chief of police, it's the mayor, a congressional leader, celebrity, and, and we go around the country doing these. And we just had one last week in Chicago. So we had the chief of Chief Bryant from Chicago, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, and actor Dondre Whitfield, you know, so we have these celebrities and these people on, but it's really about hearing from our young people. Yeah. You know, they're on the panel, but the questions and everything is coming and hearing directed from the young people. And, and every now and then I have to get to somebody that's on the panel and they start almost like they're running for an elected office because they start talking and talking to them. It's like, hey, 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 hey. This isn't about you. This is about the young people. Okay, so we're going to cut that off a little bit. Now, now let's get back to hearing from our young people. So it's important to listen and be intentional uh, in that regard as well. That's awesome. I'm sorry, Amy. I was just about to say, Jeff, we might have to talk after this because this is part of why I, I was telling Amy I call this following the breadcrumbs mm. because – when I first got back home, I did not want to get involved with AAU basketball. I wasn't trying to be a coach. I was just trying to do skill development. Yeah. But the more I, I'm passionate about it, so a lot of parents, I was working with one of my former teammates, a lot of parents gravitated to what we were doing. We played at a professional level, and it turned into AAU. And the reason why I came over to Pro Skills is because AAU can be a very toxic environment of people wanting to win, 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 win. At all costs, parents acting crazy in the stands, coaches um, conducting themselves like minors. Um, and I just found myself around all of that. People just, people trying to find that next kid they can attach themselves to so they can, I mean, it's just, it's a meat factory. And it so is. the pro, it is. So the pro skills director in Raleigh, North Carolina was my teammate overseas. And mm -hmm. so I had been talking to him for a while and he was like man you need to come over here to pro skills we're a national organization i think we stand in all of those homes we are we are trying to fight for everything that you're saying yeah. and so i reached out to the co-founders i hit our front office is in charlotte north carolina mm -hmm. so the two co-founders names are brendan winters and logan kosmowski well i played against both of them in france they both went to the davidson, davidson. brendan winters was staff's host when he was recruited. So Team yeah. Curry teams. Are I was going to say, they're both with teams. Team Curry now. 
Yes, there you go. That's our pro skills elite team. Yes, yes. Oh, man, Holland, don't you love it when this happens? This has happened so many times <laughs> afterwards. One of the things that we love saying is that you are welcome at our table, and we'll end that. But what we also love is looking at some of our guests who really didn't know each other prior to coming to the table with us and making that connection. So, yeah, mm-hmm. we'll definitely have to get you all connected for sure. Holland, talk a little bit more about this idea of, you know, when you get cut, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> Thinking about listening to kids, there's research that shows that kids trust coaches just because they're their coach, right? They, they don't even have to be a good coach. They don't even have to be a coach that leads them to winning. Just you're my basketball coach. You're my soccer coach. So I trust you. In a time of COVID, what role can trauma-informed coaching play? Hmm. I, I'll, I'll jump at this one. Um, to me, that's, it's tough because it's a matter of perspective, right? I, 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 I don't think it's one, one size fits all when it comes to that. Now, I just saw a video the other day of this, of this coach smacking this little young football player in the head. I'm just like, what? I, I, if I was standing right there, I might have to fight. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I mean, Paul, like that's, I, that hurt my heart just watching it. But at the same time, I think sometimes we lose scope of balance. Like some, sometimes how we've kind of blurred the lines of what's bullying, what's not bullying, what's being pushed, what's abuse. As long as we're reinforcing that we're trying to help the kid, I think it's a positive environment. But my father, according to today's society, how my father pushed me probably didn't fit check any of the boxes of what you're <laughs> supposed to do. <laughs> but the man that I am and the, the, the mental toughness that I have, I have to attribute to him because it, at the end of the day, he was trying to, he was trying to get me to believe myself and not give up regardless. And I think as a person in that position, you have to first learn the child. You have to take the time to learn who this kid is, how they receive information, and go about trying to help them in their own way. And that's a tedious job. It's not an overnight job. I'll jump into that one as well. Um, I think it's, it's, it's also relative to trust, right? I'll tell you, similar to, to Rashid. So I'm this New York City point guard, right, who, who thinks that He's almost the second coming of whatever best point guard you can come up with, right? So I get to college, small school, North Carolina Wesleyan College. And um, so there was this all-conference point guard ahead of me. Now, I'm a freshman. He's a senior. So I go in with the identity like, that's messed up. He's going to have to sit behind me his senior year, right? Right. And it's just like, dude, stop, you know, from a coaching standpoint, right? Coach calls me in, you know, after we go through some practices and trainings and all of that and and what have you. And he's like, Jeff, you know, that's our starting point guard. I'm like, okay, well, then where do I need to go? Right. (laughs) So he doubles down on on this coaching thing of okay and now that i don't think they even have this now but then it was okay well we're gonna put you on jv i'm like oh <laughs> h no <laughs> right. right i was like oh that ain't happening you know so it's and it's something similar to what you just said rushy right he was looking at it from a standpoint and, and his conversation back to me was, you can give up on yourself now and give up on understanding what fighting and putting in the work is about to achieve something, or you can quit and you can be like some of the other guys that can't make it playing for us here because they didn't want to trust the process and give up on it as well. He knew right where to hit me with that right of okay he know i ain't gonna give up you know i'm not a quitter you know i'm from inner city new york we don't quit you know and and so yeah i had to endure 
being on JV for a whole year. And it came to first a matter of me kind of not liking him and hating him because of him putting me on JV because of him needing to get my ego in check to year two through four, I start all three years and wind up leading the, the, the team. I still have a few records there and all of that. And going from JV to being inducted into our school's Hall of Fame for, for basketball. But if I had quit and given up, I can't say that all of that would have happened and, and I'm saying all that to say this of, of, of now days, there's a lot of, and you talk about AAU, there's a lot of coaches that are in this game for themselves, not so much for the player, you know? And, and that's why holistically about AAU, I'm not a fan, you know, from this standpoint of you gain, there's games, 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 games. Well, it's like I tell people, yeah, you can get exposure from playing in the AAU in the circuit, but you can also get exposed, okay? <laughs> so you can get exposure, but it may not be for what you want to be exposed <laughs> for, right? So you have to build that relationship with a coach and make sure that that coach is right for you and has the best interest. And even down to parents as well, because look, being very real and, and, and straightforward, sometimes parents are sometimes the issue because they will always they think and see their kid as being LeBron or Stefan, you know, D'Angelo Russell or or Dwayne Wade or fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your your son or daughter is just a good player, and that's mm -hmm. fine. That's okay. Don't make that that young person be exposed to a life that they wind up regretting even engage with the sport because you have grandiose visions of them being LeBron or Stefan when they may very well be a kid that can get a scholarship and get a free education and wind up being a great attorney or a doctor or whatever else in life. So we have to be careful about, you know, where you're fitting and where you're getting that from, from, from your coaches. As I was listening to both of you talk, I heard two things coming out. You know, I asked about trauma informed coaching and the two things y'all mentioned were establishing a relationship between the coach and the player. Yeah. And then the player getting pushed by the coach to the point of being really disappointed and hanging in there anyway. Exactly. So relationship, and I guess what you'd call structure or discipline are the two things that, that you, that you all came back with. And I don't think that's what we normally think of when we think about oh, helping someone through trauma, we think about doing something that's very soft and encouraging. And Holland, I'll tell you this, I'm, I'm, I'm old school, right? I'll, I'll just be up. I'm not one of those that believes in everybody needs to get a trophy. Yes. Right? Oh, God. I, I, I mean, that <laughs> when I was growing up playing in, in New York and in and, and all the places I played, first of all, for me, I didn't want a participation trophy, right? You get that to somebody else anyway, right? I'm there to win. I'm there to achieve and work and, and, and gain from that. You know, but we've morphed into this society and you talk about trauma. Yeah, that that for some people it may be trauma, but is it trauma for the kid or is it trauma for mommy or daddy, you know, that they didn't get recognized or get this trophy and all of these things. You, you couldn't tell me it wasn't trauma when the coach come talking about putting me on JV. That's trauma, right? You know, but I had to trust that he had the best interests at heart for me. So it was a mutual trust. Right. It was mutual. I had to trust him and he had to trust me that I was going to put in the work to eventually be able to make it to the Hall of Fame. Right. And I, I tell I tell my girls that I told them that today that this is one thing I stand on. Fair is a place where you ride rides. If you're looking for the fair, that's where you go ride rides. Life is not fair. Just like sports mm -hmm. is, is, is not fair. So 
Will you be disciplined enough to put in the work to get the results that you want? Right. Is, is that simple? That's right. I love it. Life is not fair and trust the process. There's a tension. Mm-hmm. 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 So let's think about media stories now. You mentioned this earlier, Jeff. You talked about the killing of George Floyd and these things that are coming out about police and about urban youth. What role for good or ill can media stories play in shaping how people perceive police, urban youth, and urban sp- Well, there's a few things, right? First, and, and, and I say this to, to, to people as well, just being very transparent. Are there some bad cops and law enforcement people out there? Yep, sure are. Are there some bad kids out there and all that as well? Yep, there sure are. Okay, now that we've got that out of the way, how can we come together and communicate to be able to understand where some of those differences lie, right? Okay, um, law enforcement, you know, okay, well, look, you know, as a person in the community, I just don't like when you talk to me this way and then you make me do this and you do this. Okay, that's fine. What is it that we do that makes you feel this way? Right. You can have those conversations and vice versa, law enforcement to community. Well, look, we react this way because when you do X, Y, Z or you say X, Y, Z or you reaching for stuff when we're asking you to be still, things happen. Okay, it's come to have that conversation and understanding, you know, that not all cops are bad. I, I'm a pal kid as well. I'm a product of pal. I grew up with pal in, in, in Queens, New York. It helped me to understand that, yeah, there were all law enforcement officers out there that had their very best intentions for me, probably more than I probably at that point had for myself, right? But in that same token, I also had to be able to be open and receptive to understand because at the end of the day, that law enforcement officer takes that uniform off and they're a dad to a child at home too, right? But same token for our young people, we have to understand, and again, I'm not talking about the harassing nature and all that. Again, I'm saying there's some good law enforcement officers, there's some bad ones, you know? And we have to make sure that we as well hold the bad ones accountable. You know, Houston Police Chief, Chief Acevedo, one of my favorite guys, but he's very, uh, very upfront as the, the 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 chief of all of Houston police, and he as well will tell you, yeah, there was some bad law enforcement officers, and he and he specifically said the officers that did what they did in 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 Minneapolis that was that was murder. You wouldn't get years ago. You probably wouldn't get law enforcement officers because of the the, the the blue line to say something like that about another officer, even if it was that bad about what took place in Minneapolis, right? So I think as well, it takes our law enforcement community to be able to recognize when wrong is wrong and allow community to be able to hear that. But then it also takes our community folks and young people to be able to see their side of how they're contributing to some of the craziness that's going on as well. But all of that needs to first come in with communication and and not judgment, you know, and, and openness. And I think that when that happens, especially, and that's thankfully what we are doing within our PAL programs all across the country, that we are able to have that dialogue and that intentional non-judgmental conversation and dialogue and and each side learns from each other. That's a phenomenal oh. answer and a lot to unpack there. Rashid, would you, would you want to pitch into that as well? Yeah. Um, and this is just my perspective from being, being able to live outside of the country for so long. I think a lot of the trauma, that we as Americans, adults and kids suffer is is just because we're not real. Like we, we're not a real country. And, and when I say real, I mean authentic and 100 percent genuine in all aspects of what we do. And what I mean by that is I think that everything that we do is a microcosm of who we are as a country, even like sports. 
you choose sides. We live in a country where you're forced to choose sides. Are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? Do you like the Bulls or do you like the Suns? Um, it, it, it's the same thing happens, like you kind of talk about the blue line. There, I'm not saying there aren't cops who don't tell on each other, but but my father was an MP. My, my, I got cops in my, in my family. Cops stick together. Doctors stick together. Firefighters stick together. So when you go into some of these neighborhoods, they're going to stick together. It's, it's, it's what we teach each other that you're supposed to do. Are you Christian or are you Muslim? Are you gay or are you straight? Are you, you, we, we, we create a society where everybody has to find a group that they attach themselves to without the understanding of any other group. And for the most part, I don't believe in 100%, but for the most part, each group thinks they're right. Even if I'm Christian and I'm accepting of Muslims, somewhere I still think my religion better than your religion. I'm right, something wrong. I'm not going to do anything bad to you, but in my heart, what you believe is crazy, mm -hmm. right? And for me, we do that intentionally over and over and over and over again. Like, mm -hmm. it's certain things that I don't teach my kids just because of that. I don't teach Santa Claus. I don't teach Two Fairy. I don't teach e anything that I can prove is not true. I do not teach it because I don't understand why you teach kids lies and then tell them not to lie. Mm -hmm. Only thing that's going to happen is they're going to realize that you're lying eventually and they're going to say, oh, I can tell a lie as long as it's, it's in this context. Mm. Oh, I can say this word as long as I don't say it around these people. Mm. Oh, I can behave this way as long as I don't behave this way out in public. And we all do that over and over again, and then we get to this place, and it's like everybody start pointing fingers at each other. When really, I think so much of our problem in our country, one, we're a very, very young country. Very, very young country. We're talking about 200 and some years old. These civilizations in other countries have been around thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We, we, we are like a 16-year-old kid with a billion dollars. That is who we are as a country. You give a 16-year-old a billion dollars, say, go have fun, ain't no telling what they might do. And that that is who I see us as, as a country. And nobody... The majority of us don't really understand where we come from, how we got here. How, why, are, why are these kids in the projects? Jay-Z has a famous line, you know, why they call the projects of projects? Because it's a project. The projects. <laughs> it, it's a project. Like if you go and look back through it, it's a reason why people are where they are. It's a reason why the suburbs are the way they are. It's a reason why you have private schools. It's a real like there is a history in this country that is untold. And as long as we live in a space where we will not tell the truth, then anybody can get on TV and tell a lie and say it's the truth. And to me, that's where our trauma stems from. Just not being real. We can break this stuff down. Now, some things are up for debate based off of whatever. But there's a lot of things you can research. Mm -hmm. And we know this is true. This became this. Even, even police officers. And, and I don't, it's hard sometimes to talk about groups of people authentically without somebody saying that you're against that group. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like my dad, my, I got military police officers all in my family. But the police officers have a history too. Mm -hmm. What the, what is now a police officer, and I'm not talking about the, the, the individual person. I'm talking about mm -hmm. the entity. It began as slave patrol. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. So when you when you have some of these things reciprocate itself in 2020, when do we get to the point where we say, okay, how did this institution start? How was it created? And when it was first created, what was its job? Mm -hmm. Once you look at it from that aspect, I think we can attack it Differently, and I'm not just harping on police officers. I'm talking about so many. I'm, I'm talking about from how we feed our kids to how we how we uh, teach our kids. When I when I moved back here from France and I start working with kids, it seemed like every third kid that I talked to was on attention medicine. I just left a country for 13 years. Kids are not on attention medicine, so something's wrong. But those kids also had three recesses at school. They also ate real food and not processed sugars. And to me, it all goes back to the same thing, and it's money. We make decisions based off of money. And the money dictates our morality, it dictates our religion, it dictates where we work, it dictates how we live, it dictates how we communicate with each other, it dictates how we respond to each other. 
And I, I feel really in my spirit that right now what we're going through as a society, as a globe, is the universe or nature or God or whatever you want to call it, like holding up a real big sign like, y'all better change. Like, we better change how we're doing, how we eat, how we take care of each other, how we communicate with each other, how we teach our kids, how we go to work, what we, what, what we attribute importance to. Because the fundamental part of humans is connection and love. That's why we're so able, that's why we can trigger each other like that because we're connected whether we want to be or not. So mm -hmm. for me, in so many different avenues of conversation, if we would just go back to the core or the root or the beginning of these things and figure out how we got here, we then can start talking about it in a different way. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you guys off because I have a feeling we need to leave a little bit for episode two, for part two. <laughs> As we wrap up part one, um, you know, Rashid, I'm going to start with you first because you just, you just hit us with a litany of stuff. And I want you to boil it down. You know, um, one of the great things about um, communication is being succinct in a summary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the the essential element we need to understand as you talked about change? What's the essential element that can change how we think about sports and a game and how that changes a neighborhood or a nation for good? Jeff touched on it earlier, it's commitment. That's a very big word because it touched so many different facets. If you're committed to something, you're open to change. You're open to listening. You're open to doing the works it takes to reach the required result. Um, that's a big word. And that's a team concept. If you want to win and your job is to set screens, you have to be committed to it. Or Steph is not going to be open for the shot. So commitment. I love it. I love it. All right, Jeff, how about you? What's your essential element? Yeah, I mean, that, actually, that's it. I mean, committed. You know, you just need to commit yourself um, and, and be, being willing to do the work, you know, that's, that's the thing is don't always seek to, to press the fast forward button. Sometimes you need to hit the pause button and go through what it is that you need to go through right now, you know, and, and don't try and fast forward through the difficulty because what you're seeking to get to won't be fulfilling. Um, you know, if you fast forward and you miss all of the trials and the tribulations that you learn along the way. Yeah. What, what is meant for evil can be so good, but you know, mm -hmm. we have to hit the pause button because you know, what's going to happen. That lesson's going to come up. If you didn't learn it the first time, it's going to come back. Oh yeah. Exactly. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, good. Jeff and Rashid. We're gonna we gotta draw a line here. We're gonna have more to come. So thank you, Jeff and Rashid, for being part of this important conversation. And while you wait for part two, please go to theafterwardpodcast.com and become a subscriber. Leave us a review at Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcast, and tell your friends about us. And as always, you are welcome at our table.